Hi hey everyone, welcome back to another year to the spring series of live events of the MITx MicroMasters in Supply Chain Management. I'm Miguel Rodríguez García, a researcher at MIT Center for Transportation Logistics here in Boston, and I'm the course lead for SE1X Supply Chain Fundamentals. So first of all, thank you so much everyone for joining us today. As I said, this is the first live event of the spring series, which is a series of cross-course live events that we do between SE1X Supply Chain Fundamentals and SE3X Supply Chain Dynamics. Um, that's why I'm really happy to be co-hosting this event with uh, my colleague, Jeff Baker, course lead for SC3X. Hi, Jeff. How are you? I'm doing great, Miguel. Thanks. And thank you for that introduction. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here with you all. We're excited to share you know, some great insights about risk and resilience in this event. So today we're going to have this following agenda. First, um, our speaker is going to speak for about 25 minutes. After that, there'll be some time at the end, probably around 15 minutes, uh, when she'll answer questions from the audience. So we encourage you to participate, but in doing so, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom. Don't use the chat box, the Q&A feature. Uh, so Miguel and I will take these questions and get as many uh, to our speaker as uh, we can. But before we introduce our guest speaker, uh, we want to share something with you all, right, Miguel? Yes, that's right, Jeff. So um, we just want to remind everyone uh, that verification for both courses, SC1 and SC3X, is still open. Uh, we'll be posting the verification links on the chat right now for make it easy to make it easy for you guys. Remember, verification is really important for those of you who are taking the courses because the only chance to get a certificate from us from MIT, uh, of course, upon successful completion. Um, but it's also the best way to support the program, and it's what allows us to keep giving away this kind of context for free to thousands of learners around the world. So if you like the content, if you like what we do, please verify so we can keep doing this for you guys. And without further ado, uh, let's introduce our guest speaker, Jeff. Okay, thanks, Miguel. Hey, today we're honored uh, to have my good friend Danica Porter as our guest speaker. Uh, Danica and I go back to the very first MicroMasters cohort. Uh, we went through that, and we both went to MIT to obtain the master's degree in supply chain management way back in 2018. Um, I know we've got a lot of uh, potential MicroMasters hopefuls out there in the audience today, and I can't think of a better example of Danica as someone that used the MicroMasters road to springboard uh, her career. Um, she's had tremendous success after MIT, uh, been very busy. She's a partner at IOTA Consulting, uh, where she consults in supply chain management, project management, data analytics. She's also a lecturer at the Dillon School of Business in Lethbridge, Calgary. And if that wasn't enough, she's also completing her PhD in cardiology at the Cummings School of Medicine at the University of Calgary, uh, where she's applying some of the things she learned at MIT in her background in clinical practice. So welcome, Danica. Thank you so much. It is uh, great to see you again, Jeff. Uh, like Jeff mentioned, we've known each other since, you know, the initial start. Uh, and great to meet you and see you again, Miguel, as well. I'm excited to be here today. Okay, well, thanks so much for joining us. So uh, without further ado, let's get started. The floor is yours, Danica. All right. I will share my screen. Looks great. Okay. Wonderful. All right. So it's been an interesting four years, I would say, in the world, a lot of companies went from thriving and doing really well to surviving or barely surviving, barely clinging on. So we'll go over a little bit of how to deal with some risk and uh, looking into the future and what you can do to protect your supply chains. So quick review of the table of contents. Chris gonna talk about, I you know, like to have some fun, fun words and fun titles. So rose-colored glasses because everything was, you know, great in the world uh, and talking about sort of previous trends and strategies that were used in supply chain. Then we will go into uh, surviving and <clears throat> then we will look at the, what I call the R words, and then we'll go into uh, thriving. So let's get started. As I said, rose-colored glasses, the world looked really great in 2018 and um, 2019. And some of the trends and strategies that were really common was this lovely thing about stability. You could really predict a lot of what was going to happen. And stability allowed for this immense amount of predictability. You had really awesome, robust lead times, which led to minimal variability. You had, you know, no need to update your supplier information because oh, they were just, you know, an email or a phone call away. 
you know, data over day. You could use your prior year's forecast. You could rely on this previous data because you sort of knew if you had some seasonality, you knew if you uh, were gonna have a big, you know, sale, things looked really good. It was really easy um, to predict all of your future demand. And then of course there was this heavy reliance on data analytics because you knew that you could do all this predictive stuff. You could really then begin to rely on honing and um, optimizing. Unfortunately, this sort of like moved into what was known as the like lean and mean supply chains. We went from lean with a capital L to lean with a lowercase L being lean and mean. There were a number of uh, articles and by a number I, I looked through and there was about 30 different articles sort of in the span of 12 months. And that was just off the top of my head of ones being like lean and mean. We need to change our supply chains. We need to uh, reduce, reduce, reduce all this different waste. Um, and so what that led to was not wanting to spend money on inventory. Well, if we have a really robust lead time, we know when we're gonna get our inventory, we know when everything is gonna arrive so we can have you know, less safety stock. Um, we don't really need to have relationships with suppliers because, well, there's lots out there. I can just grab a new one. We'll just send a generic email to a generic inbox and that's how we will put our PO in. It also led to employees feeling like they were a bit um, dispensable, that they didn't really you know, matter. So we had some unhappy employees and um, training and cross training wasn't really seen as important. We'll just hire somebody new. It's fine. We don't need to train anybody. Everyone can just sort of specialize and really just know their job. And then we had some high inventory turnover and companies just focused on their profits. Right. Well, it worked. The boards were happy. Stocks were up. Everybody was great. Um, so again, we sort of moved towards these competing metrics. We now had departments that competed against each other, not typically on purpose, but in a bit they did. You'd have the transport department saying, okay, you need to reduce costs. Well, how do they do that? Well, then they're not gonna pick up as much inventory uh, or they're not gonna bring in as many things uh, as frequently. It'll be one large order. They'll wait until they have a full truck instead of doing LTLs. And then your inventory is also told to reduce money, but yet you're now having to buy in bulk because your transportation side is not going to go pick up smaller partial loads. So that was sort of the competing metrics. So, but it still worked out and everything seemed to be great. And it was, you know, what could possibly go wrong? We've optimized everything. What, what risk do we have? And these thoughts and these comments that I, you know, heard was, it's a waste of time. It's a, it's a waste of money to plan for risks that we don't think will, you know, ever occur. Oh, a giant, you know, virus taking, now nah, that'll be fine. We'll be okay. Like we're strong. We got this figured out. Um, so that didn't really go very well, which resulted in some survival tactics, you know, 2020 arrived and what was supposed to be just a 14 day shutdown <laughs> resulted in months and months and months. And just like when it felt like we had sort of understood where we were going, how we could get, you know, move forward. Oh, we had the ever given uh, block the Suez Canal. And then we had Russia invade Ukraine. And then we ended up with sort of all other discrepancies and disruptions. And then of course, we even had pirates come back and I'm not talking about Captain Jack Sparrow. I know that Disney is doing a remake, but uh, these are not the same pirates, unfortunately. All of these events happened inside of four years, right? Like what a time for us to uh, be alive. Just year after year, we're pummeled with something new. And obviously when you don't have risk planning, you don't have that safety stock, you're going to feel the pain. So these prior strategies where we'd run really lean and mean, we tried to sort of optimize and just run at this bare basic, obviously resulted in decreased capacity. Workers couldn't work, you know, side by side, they had to have six feet on either side of them. So that reduced output for manufacturing and on the production line, then decreased uh, availability due to COVID was just further exacerbated by the ever given. And then, 
even more so by the Russian Ukraine war and we had the shutdown of factories and and ports were closed off and this led to shortages in every area right you could not go anywhere without seeing oh back order oh out of stock or even empty shelves demand then became incredibly unpredictable as back orders like i said were really really common customers were searching for other options they needed to go somewhere else um they had to either create their own services, find a new service provider, or they went without. So then we had labor force swings as people began to either pull out of the market or be furloughed or laid off. They went back to school. They went on and you know started their own companies or worked somewhere else. And so companies that were once really excelling and on top of their game are suddenly barely surviving. And we saw a lot of this question. I got asked it a lot, like, well, when is normal going to come back? And it's not. Change is the new normal. We have to learn to be adaptable. This increased instability due to all these different global events that we are experiencing are just sort of going to you know, continue to happen, especially now that we have climate change that has stepped up to add this fun layer of transportation issues, of you know, mass kind of destruction. It can result in food insecurity. And this constant unpredictability has obviously placed immense pressure on supply chains. And these you know, once sought after lean and mean uh, supply chains were really unpredictable and unreliable and they lacked resiliency. There, were, there was no room for error. Everything had to go perfectly. And if it didn't, everything, you know, the wheels fell off. So companies really need to adjust. And this, you know, sort of begs the question, like, what can we actually be done? So the three R words that I say are uh, risk, redundancy, and that leads to resiliency. So our awareness of how this you know, anthropomorphizing uh, a company, making it lean and mean, oh, it should be like, absolute bare bones run on the minimum because that's going to save and make as much profit as possible was really not beneficial. So now we need to shift our focus. We need to shift our strategy because we constantly have these storms that we need to weather. So like I said, these uh, three simple words, risk, understanding it, redundancy, building a little bit of it in, and then that results in uh, resiliency. So no time like the present to prepare for disaster. One of my favorite quotes uh, is, luck favors the prepared. And it's like, yes, if you prepare for these risks and you've built in this redundancy, you'll probably end up okay in the end. So let's dive into some of the strategies that we can do. So first of all, let's begin with risk. We need to be able to identify risk, right? The first part of any program is figuring out where your risks are or what they are. So a great way to dive into this is just to look at different functions. Is there operational risks? Are there cultural risks? What about financial or legal implications? You know, economic, how's the economy doing? Security, that's you know, cybersecurity, just even generic security within your say warehouse or office go through and begin to identify these risks. This can be done in a number of ways. You can do it through blue sky, which is a pretty unformal approach. You sit down and you just literally throw out ideas. Oh, an alien invasion. Oh, we have something like this. And you just really look at how this potential risk could impact that area of the business. And then obviously you want to create a plan for that have these contingency plans. What happens if we have a supplier that suddenly goes out of business? Can we get this part other an, from another supplier? Do we have other options? Have we verified that we have really good options? So now that you've identified some of these risks, you're gonna create these contingency plans. You then wanna build in some of this redundancy, right? A little bit of wiggle room. So. Redundancy, you've picked your area of risk, 
Now you're going to identify some of the areas that you can put that redundancy in. If you have critical inventory or you have critical people, this one person holds the key to the castle. And if they're not around, like people don't get paid or we can't access our banking or they're the one that placed this specific order or we have processes that are really critical or suppliers, we need to make changes uh, that's going to reduce that you know, bottleneck and that criticality on them. So maybe that looks like holding a little bit more safety stock, cross-training your employees, actually understanding what the employees want, updating processes to make sure that they actually are like the written process is, is what is happening. Quite often companies are like, oh yeah, we have processes written up. But if you actually look at the day-to-day -day and you look at the process, there is a vast difference. So making sure that these processes are constantly updated and accurate. Uh, this also looks like creating relationships with your suppliers. We shouldn't just throw out this generic email, this email box, be like, oh, I just need an order of, you know, this many things, or I need this much stuff to come in on this date. Have a relationship with your supplier, understand where they are in the world, truly like their office might be close by, but where is the product coming that you are buying from them? Also, understanding your supplier market. Who else is available? Who is Who else is buying from these specific suppliers? How are you and, and your company going to be, you know, prioritized? And then what happens if you're not prioritized anymore, right? So having these, you know, plans once you've identified some of these areas and putting in some of that redundancy. So having, you know, multiple different supplier options. You might not order from only you know one or two, but you have three or four that are approved. They've gone through the procurement process and they are available to you. We're gonna go off topic just really shortly because like, as Jeff uh, kindly said, I'm doing my PhD in cardiology, specifically in electrophysiology. And guess what? Us humans have redundancies. The heart has a multiple of them. So, this allows us to be adaptive, to survive through sort of little, you know, blips. And so what we're seeing here is a cardiac action potential. And this is what makes your heart beat. This is the electrical currents and the ion channels that make your heart beat. So you'll see at the bottom here, these nice little uh, lines, some of them overlap, right? So if one of these ion channels doesn't open, there is overlap your heart is still going to go through its full cycle of beat, maybe not as expertly, but it is still going to go through and beat properly, right? One channel dysfunctions, it's not the end of the world. Even if you have two, there's so much built-in redundancy here. And what it does is it allows the human body to be adaptive to what is going on in its own system. There's no failure, right? If our heart didn't have redundancy, any dysfunction or weirdness that would occur would result in your heart stopping. So obviously this lovely redundancy provides this cushion so that you can keep going on and you probably won't even notice that your sodium channel didn't open for quite as long as it should have this one beat because your heart will beat about, you know, 120,000 times every single day. So the point is our human bodies have redundancy. Our organizations should as well. So moving forward with these new strategies, becoming resilient, right? So after we've identified the risks and we understand what redundancies are useful, we can move forward to this more resilient um, focused. So we can look at all the different types of technology that you can use. How do we collect our data? How often are we collecting it? Where is it stored? What are some of the metrics that we can then pull from the data that we have? And can we set up any of these system flags? Hey, like we're running a little bit low on this part, or hey, this supplier constantly seems to be late, or hey, we have you know a report saying that this supplier is actually filed for bankruptcy protection, or you know what have you? What technology, what systems, software can we be using? Then we can look at the transparency, making sure that we have a single source of truth for our data. It shouldn't be living on someone's spreadsheet on their desktop. It should be in a system that's easily accessed and also one in which people can't 
adjust or change um, the data and making sure that it's actual, you know, real data. It's coming from real uh, places. It could be finance pulling from all the invoices that AP has scanned and everything else and all the other things that are coming in through AR. There should be conflict free goals. We're not pitting transportation against inventory or, you know, sales against marketing. We're trying to have holistic goals for the entire uh, company. And then even going down and understanding your customers and client base, the part characteristics, the demand that you might be experiencing. Um, and then you can move forward to coordinating. So specifically tailoring your inventory management. Not all parts need to have the same amount of safety stock. Uh, not all parts need to be watched and managed the same way. So understanding what different uh, inventory management techniques you're going to use. Talking to your suppliers. How are you having those relationships? How are you managing their performance? Like, are you tracking the fact that they're on time, delayed, they consistently send poor quality things, whatever, like sharing that information with you, but also throughout the company. Many times there's multiple different sourcing and procurement departments, and you'll bring in one supplier for one thing in a different area of the business and not even know that you shouldn't be using them for this because they're not performing well, right? So removing those silos and sharing that information. And it's the same with that human capital management, your people management. You really want to make sure that you are sharing information, you are cross-training, you are understanding what is going on at that people level. People require different, you know, environments and different uh, ways of being managed as well. So going in to some quick examples, because I think being applicable is really, really useful. So say we have identified an operational risk of a sole supplier for a critical part. Well, the plan can then be is that operations should review making this, you know, specific piece versus buying it, whereas the sourcing department can look for a new supplier. So we can understand, can we actually make this in-house if we absolutely had to? Should we be making it in-house? Would that actually benefit or work with the business that we're doing? Or... And while we're understanding that, we can have the sourcing and procurement team go out and look for other suppliers to potentially add to our list to go through and vet. And so then that moves us to that little redundancy piece so we can find and onboard these new suppliers. And then we can kind of cultivate a relationship with them so that we have this existing relationship and we can then you know, move forward from there. If something happens with our sole source, we actually have backups they're noted in the system, they've gone through, they've been approved. So we can very quickly just make and move an order to that. And so that is that resiliency piece is having that adaption, having that backup available for your emergencies. It's why most vehicles come with a spare tire, run flat tires, things like that. It's why when you go into an exam, you usually bring three different pens because what if one doesn't work, right? We wanna have that ability to be resilient that ability to adapt to a changing scenario. Yet another example, because I really like them, lead time. Lead time used to be pretty robust, especially with you know transportation over the ocean. But now with examples with the pirates, the Suez Canal, um, even the Panama Canal has been experiencing a lot of issues due to all the drought from our lovely friend climate change. So we don't have these robust lead times anymore. Okay. So We've identified this risk. We know where it is. What is their redundancy? Are there items that we can use air freight for? Or is anything suitable for that? Uh, perhaps work with a freight forwarder company that has a different route, but we still know where the product's going to go. We just then know our lead time is going to be longer. So just understanding what the risk is and then making that you know redundancy plan to fill in the gaps. They're like, what happens if this happens? And that again, like I said, it leads to being resilient. It leads to the ability to be adaptable because you now have multiple options for shipping these parts and or these finished goods or receiving them because you've looked into these options and you understand you know, the cost that it'll, it will be to say air freight it versus the cost of going on back order or stocking out 
and you can you know play with that lovely equation but you have the information there you can make informed decisions about this so all of these risk identifications and redundancy additions resulting in uh, resiliency obviously means that we are going to be thriving as you know an organization and and even as uh, people so it changes things right so we can now thrive through these natural disasters uh one of my favorite little stories is that there was this bakery in the, the midwest of the u.s and they were very prepared for situations they had an entire list of all their inventory and i do mean like all of their machinery all of their like sacks of flour they knew everything that they had and so when a tornado ripped through that area they were able to call up their insurance company with this lovely long list of all the items where they had bought them when they had bought them the receipts and everything and say okay this is exactly what we need to rebuild the insurance company was like oh this is great this is so easy here you go here's all your money so they were able to start back up on their business faster than any other you know um restaurant bakery other supplier in this town so they then managed to get all this business because they were the ones that could be baking sooner and making food sooner this also helps against having supplier issues when you have different suppliers you have actual approved alternates and you have these relationships you can understand and say okay would it be beneficial to move to this supplier they have a bit better a price maybe their lead time is a little bit longer however it's a very robust lead time i now have options and i have alternatives shipping costs increases again you understand the routes that you are already taking okay should we then put this on a train should we keep this on a truck for longer what are our other alternatives we have those readily available at our fingertip um and then our ever changing demand we've seen so many different fad things where everything's become popular and suddenly nothing is popular and you're like i just overproduced so we have the safety stock to deal with, these quick increases, and then using interchangeable components allows you to say, okay, this is this item is no longer really popular. We can still use parts of it in other things that we are making. So that demand change, we can be really flexible with it. So we've identified the risk, we create these nice little redundancies for ourselves, and now we are able to thrive through all of this change. So like I said, that conclusion to creating these resilient and uh, adaptable supply chains involves using this long-term focus, which starts with doing your basic risk analysis, creating some of those fun little redundancies, and then you achieve that resiliency because resiliency is just another word for being adaptable and able to cope with a different uh, situation or scenario that you are presented with. And these ones are now more reliable doing this when it's calm much better because cooler heads always prevail so thank you and if you have any questions i assume they should be put into the q a section <laughs> on zoom yeah no yeah. Th thank you so much danica for for that presentation it was great i, I love the metaphor with the uh, with the heart uh, as a, you know how it makes uh, a resilient human being it, it was great uh, so yeah. yeah, as Danica said, guys, if you have any questions, please use the Q and A feature. We already have a bunch of them, so we are going to start um, kind of like using those. Um, so the first question that I have, because this is something actually that that was in my head already, and a couple of um, our um, learners today asked. So this is from Amrin the Ray, and and this person is asking, how did you calculate the return of investment for risk management, and uh, I guess this person is thinking, okay, a lot of these events, you know, uh, the likeliness yeah. of them happening is really hard to predict. So yep. we do know the cost probably if yep. it happens, but it's hard to convince management to do something when totally. the likeliness of those potential events, like a pandemic or, or war or whatsoever, it's so, so hard to forecast. So how, how do you work in this sense, you know, with management uh, in terms of the presenting a strong return of investment to them, um, to convince them to, to work on resilience. <laughs> to, to do this so that we're not stuck. Yeah. Um, I think one of the best places to start is to understand what it would cost to 
have these stockouts, to suddenly not be able to get this part? What does that actually look like? Or what does it mean to not have enough items or services to meet your demand? And you can just do a really simple calculation of, okay, like this is what we're expecting to get in terms of, you know, profit on this item. If now suddenly this is back ordered, um, where are these customers, consumers going to go? Are we the only person? Are we the only company they can buy from? Or are they going to go very quickly? Like how substitutable is what we provide um, and understanding sort of like that power relationship. So porters by forces is a great way to start just to understand where your organization sits in um, the market. And then understanding just the cost of losing business or the cost of having a shutdown because you don't have a specific part for your you know, line operation and now you can't produce the specific uh, thing or your production has you know, severely diminished uh, capacity. And just, I, I work backwards and say, okay, like what's the cost of not having this? And you can't necessarily say, oh, what's the cost of like going through the scenario? It's, the, it's what's the cost of if we can't meet our demand? What is the cost when we can't get what we need? How many days or hours of like safety stock do we have? How long does it take to get this part? <laughs> How angry will the cut, you know, sort of some of it, it is, it's hard to put into like numbers, but you can, you can kind of, it doesn't need to be exact as long as your reasoning is sound. It's like, okay, well, this is what we sell this for. This is the profit on this, you know, service or this. And if, you know, it doesn't matter what the event is. If we are suddenly not able to provide that, this is the, the loss that we are going to be experiencing this day. And in our industry, only certain number of uh, customers are going to come back. They're going to find a, a substitute, right? Um, so that's a, a really good way of explaining it and starting there and just doing some, you know, back of the envelope numbers. It doesn't need to be this amazing, you know, robust, like I created, you know, an algorithm or I have like all of these charts. It's just like, okay, in a very basic sense, this is the cost of not having it should something go wrong. And then you can also do the cost of having a little bit of excess inventory or a little bit of excess, um, you know, stock or adding a new supplier. And that cost is usually quite minimal. So you can just compare them and be like, okay, and this is the cost of just adding like one extra day. We have the warehouse space or we have the, the people available. And this is the cost if we don't. And so that is usually a pretty easy way. And it's like, you're still going to get pushback because again, companies and organizations they depend so heavily especially if they're public on that shareholder price it's like oh we don't want to be spending extra money and it's like okay however this is the money you're going to lose yeah. if we don't maybe spend like a tiny bit more and it's just sort of flipping it and pushing it onto them saying like it's cheaper to do this than yeah. you know lose all of this business yeah, it's so. almost like an insurance policy, really. That's the way yeah. I've looked at it and, and, and told people. It's like, what's the cost if you lose this? You know, that insurance policy may be worth it, you know, when yeah. you know, when you get into that supply chain accident, that, that's almost inevitable. And so the, the next question we have is from from Arslan. Um, it, it, it's kind of in the, in the same vein of like, we've got these beautiful algorithms. We've got economic order quantities. We know how to calculate yep. safety stocks and everything Ooh. mathematically. We know exactly how to respond. But the more these extreme events come, I think we're seeing, yeah. you know, there's a normality distribution in, in errors and we may not be seeing that. So his question is, well, how do supply chains respond in the aftermath of these tumultuous periods? What do you do if, if the math doesn't necessarily work out? I don't think that the, the math for me has always been a place to start. Okay. It is not the end and it shouldn't be. You shouldn't be calculating and being like, great, I did the EOQ and this is what it is because we know that those beautiful equations were built in a vacuum. They assume a lot of things that we cannot assume in real life, right? So we, we can't assume that everything is, you know, this robust lead time is actually this. We know the variance is really big or we know that the price fluctuations are there. So to me, those equations and that math is, is the beginning. It is a great place to start and to understand, okay, 
how do, do all these factors, you know, play a role in where I should be? And then dive in and understand, okay, like, is this truly, you know, say a new fuel, like our holding cost, is this actually the cost of bringing this item in? Let's play around with some of these numbers. Let's make it like ours. I, I'm always a big fan, like even in cardiology, it's just like, oh yeah, this is like the specific cut point. It's like, okay, that's great. We had to draw a line in the sand somewhere. That still means as a human, you should be pushing farther to say, okay, does this answer actually make sense for the situation that we've been in? How uh, adaptable is it? And then you can also play around. So this is like best case scenario, EOQ. And then this is worst case scenario. Like, let's see what these changes are. I don't think relying on all of these algorithms is particularly like useful. You need to have your own intuition, you know, AI and, and ML, like they're not, there's no intuition there. They don't, it's just, they're looking at previous data and they've, okay. And then we're going to like, this is the pattern that we see now. And we, we push it through as a human, you have to identify and understand that these patterns change. So that is a great place to start. And then use your human intuition to, you know, go around and figure out, okay, does this actually make sense for the situation that we are in? Because again, quite often, no, it doesn't. But that math and that algorithm and that output is a good place to start and then just dig farther from there. And I think people are so reliant now on that, like data analytics. It's like, oh, it's of course it's right. And it's like, yes, in a vacuum. Because it's just looking at the previous data, it's, it, it can't necessarily, it's like, yes, this is how people acted in the past. It doesn't mean they're gonna react this way in the future, right? We already know people are not rational. Pretty certain a famous economic uh, <laughs> economist said that, that people do not behave rationally, right? So just because people went super buying on certain things, you know, last you know, issue does not mean that that is going to be the same case going forward. And so we need to take that human aspect, that human element and intuition and put that forward and push them with these calculations. Yep, got to pass the sniff test, right? Yeah. So Miguel, do we have another question in there? Yeah, sure. And I actually loved your answer, Danica, because I mean, we know all this AI revolution and everything that is going on and the the, the pressure actually that even companies yeah. have to be yeah. implementing tools, uh, analytical tools, basically, even if they don't know what they're doing with them. <laughs> so, and that's the, that's uh, the problem is that yeah. they think that they're going to like throw AI at it and like it's going to fix everything. I'm like, yes. AI needs to know what you are looking for. It also needs really good data. data so if your data yeah, is really sparse good. or inaccurate, you're going to end up, you know, garbage in, garbage out, right? Yeah. So AI is not, it's like saying, oh, we're going to have an Excel strategy. Like, what? No, you're not. You're going to use Excel to help you get where you need. That's the same AI and NML, any of them. They're a tool that you can use, but they need to be used appropriately. And they're not going to solve like the world's problems Biggest at your problem. organizational level like yeah. that's just not going to um happen so we yeah to... I, I totally agree and i think from our research here at mit that's what we are seeing too like they, they are amazing tools really powerful tools but but they are not the solution to everything and human beings at the end of the day we we need to be there to make the decisions because we are deciding for ourselves so, so yeah. if, if we yeah. if we don't put our thoughts into this yeah, we are yeah. not going to end up where we want. So definitely. So yeah, we have more questions. We still have a few minutes left. So I'm going to, um, yeah, I'm going to choose this one from Simon Clafford. Um, so this learner is asking, what are the key vulnerabilities uh, that you see, Danica, in our current supply chains? Because you have talked a little bit about, you know, potential shortages and if stock, but yeah. did you see anything else that you think is critical that companies need to be looking at in terms of? you know, those vulnerabilities yeah, I, in the supply chain. Yeah, and I honestly, I think it's that the relationship piece. It's the supplier relationship piece. Everyone depends on suppliers as well as their customers. And it's the non-tangibles, right? You can run an algorithm and say, I know I need to know this, but knowing somebody at the supplier or understanding how the supplier operates, understanding your customer base, like that's another one I think people, you go and you're like, really, that's an odd choice. Like, why would they have done that? And it's very clear that they haven't talked to or understood that, you know, end user. Um, and that's not something you're going to necessarily get by just running all these algorithms. It's it's creating these personal 
relationships. I think we've gone too far into the automation where what used to be a phone call, hey, I need to place an order for this is now you do up a you know purchase order form, you put it and send it to this like really generic, you know, order here at blah, blah, blah company. You're like, I don't even know who is on the other end. And we saw that during COVID and then, you know, all these other supplier issues where people suddenly didn't actually know who they were communicating with on the end. They're like, oh, well, I always just send it to this generic email. I, I don't know who I'm talking to. I, can, I don't even have a name of a person to go on LinkedIn and try and find someone at that company, right? We pulled so far back into automation that we forgot that there are all these humans. It's the same with like your actual people. Depending on the firm that you're at, your people are your inventory and you need to look after them. We've seen such a surge of strikes, right? Like how many or companies threatening to go on strike or, you know, unions threatening to go on, like, treating your people well again we throw this like analytical stuff at them and then we're like yeah this is how much time they should be taken off or this is what we should pay and it's like these are humans that you're you're dealing with so making sure that they actually enjoy being at your company that you're paying a wage that is you know commiserate with where they where else they could go it's like oh we have really high turnover maybe you should look into that right like i think the biggest frustration and the reason why I end up in all these different companies to go and fix stuff is because they don't know what the metric is actually telling them. They just see and they get a metric at the end and it's like, okay, cool, that looks that looks great. And it's like, do you know what that actually means? And do you know where it came from or how to fix it? So I think in general, supply chains rely so much on sort of math and they forget that there's a whole other piece that goes along with it of like actually understanding what that metric means, not in terms of like the industry as a whole, but for their organization. Is this, does this make sense for your organization to have a you know churn rate or turnover rate of people this high or to have inventory sit for this long? Or is this normal for you? And what can we do about it? So it's like actually using the metrics to understand. So when I teach supply chain at the university and I teach project management at the university, my big focus is on, okay, that's great that you can calculate the metric, but what does it mean? And what if I change this one piece to this you know, metric calculation? What does that new metric tell you? And understanding all of the stuff behind it, because you can calculate math and you can have all these software programs, but if you don't understand what that metric means or what that <laughs> output actually is, you're not gonna be able to make the changes that you need to make or understand that you are performing really well either and then you might tinker with stuff and it's like you can just you can leave that one alone it is good like it's fine so I think we get very focused in on the numbers and we forget that there's people there's other things around it and then truly understanding what the metric means and what that output actually means is a big sort of overarching issue with supply chain we've gone almost too analytical I think okay great so we've got a, a question from Vi it says I want to ask about the role of technology in ensuring resilience. So what kind of technology solutions can we have? Could you name some example of critical technologies or tools that can help us achieve resilience? I mean, it depends on what your organization already uses. Like you just need to make sure that the data that you're collecting, like let's start at the ground level, the least, and I'm sexy place. No one cares about the data cleanup, but that's the most important start. It does not matter what technology you have if the data that you're collecting is not good. You can do everything in Excel if you want. I've seen it and I've seen it done well because you can you know, have Excel on a shared drive and information is pulled in, you can use SharePoint. But if you do not have good data, you do not know where it comes from or it's not you know, input in a structured manner, you don't have a good data management um, system, it does not, it, you're, it doesn't matter what IT system you use because it's all gonna be garbage. Because again, these technology systems have no intuition. They do not know that writing January 1st, you know, 1990 is the same as 1990-01-01, right? They don't, they can't discern that as well. Or you'd have to then tell it and write a bunch of lines of code to say, these all equal the same. Um, so it, it matters more on your data quality and the access you have to data and the timely access. So the technology, you can use whatever you want, 
but it's the data that matters the most. Yeah, thank you so much for for your answers, Danica. I think uh, we are we are on time, so I think we are gonna uh, wrap it up here. Uh, thank mm -hmm. you so much for for everything, guys, um, and of course, thank you, Danica, first uh, for for joining us today uh, and all of our learners. It's been a super insightful session in supply chain risk management. And before we say goodbye, I just want to remind a couple of things to the audience. The first, uh, this was the first live event of the spring series, as I said at the beginning. So we are going to have two more webinars coming. One is going to be in uh, May, the other one is going to be in June. So guys, stay tuned for that. Um, and also, as uh, we mentioned, enrollments is still uh, open for SEC1X and SEC3X, and verification is also open. So um, closing very soon, though, in a couple of weeks. So if you're enrolled, uh, but you haven't verified yet, uh, we encourage you to go ahead and do it. Uh, as we said, this is the, the best way you guys have to support us. And um, finally, Jeff, thank you so much. Uh, Danica, again, thank you so much for everything. <laughs> if you want to uh, share some final words, the, the stage is uh, for both of you guys to say goodbye. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for tuning in today. Um, I really have enjoyed my time at MIT and doing my MicroMasters, so I highly um, encourage all of you to go through and finish your MicroMasters. You will not regret learning more things from the best institution in the world. So it was a pleasure to meet all of you today and enjoy the rest of your day. And good luck with your MITx micromasters. Couldn't have said it better myself, Danica. Yeah. So on, on behalf of uh, Miguel and myself and the entire MicroMasters team, thanks everyone for attending. We appreciate the engagement, the number of questions you asked. Uh, thrilling to to see Danica here speak on it. Um, have a great rest of your day, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great day.